Good afternoon. I think we've got, uh, we had such a large crowd, we were hoping we'd get everybody served. It looks like we've, we have. Once again, I want to, um, want to wish you all a, a, a good new year, and hopefully we're going to hear good things about the, good, uh, the new year. My name's Rich Terrapak, and I'm president of the CMC board, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today and hopefully for many forums during the year. Uh, as Jane said, please turn off your cell phones or at least turn them to a function where you can still tweet. And if Urban's in the room, I'm sorry. Uh, the, uh, apparently he won't let the team, uh, team tweet. I uh, want to talk first of all about our upcoming CMC events. Uh, next week, January 11th, we have the, the Innovative University Resources and Aspirations with the incomparable president of The Ohio State University, E. Gordon Gee. You'll want to make reservations this afternoon for this event. It may sell out, um, and we, uh, we hope to see you there. We have a really strong lineup of forums to begin 2012, and you'll find the information on all of the upcoming uh, forums uh, on our website at columbusmetro.com and in the program. We hope you take the program with you today as a reminder to yourself about the programs and also post it someplace prominent in your home or place of, uh, of work and, and uh, inform some others about the forums. We'd love to have guests. Um, it's always a treat to introduce new members and today we'd like to welcome Paul Carringer of Caring Direct Corporation, Bill Plesich of Rainier C Construction, and Grenever Rainier, not related to Rainier Construction, of the Franklin County Prosecutor's Office. It just was coincidental. Uh, if you're here, I know Bill is. Please stand so we can recognize you and welcome you. If you're a guest today, please consider membership. Uh, there's, you can find an application for membership on the uh, uh, table in the, in the front, and uh, P. Susan will be help, uh, happy to help you fill that out. Um, and, uh, and join us, uh, because your first forum lunch is on us. Sponsor recognition. Uh, we want to point out the companies listed on the back of your program today. These companies uh, sponsor our programs throughout the year. Their sponsorship provides nearly 50% of CMC's annual budget. If there's anyone you think should be on that list as well, please um, talk to our staff, uh, and Jane Scott would be happy to help with that. Today's sponsor, we're happy to begin this year's program with one of our strongest allies. Please join me in thanking Eric Weigel, John Schwantes, and their colleagues with the Columbus Dispatch for sponsoring our program today. <laughs> The economy is always in the headlines, um, so it's been CMC's tradition to begin each year with an economic forecast. Our first panelist uh, is the Chief Economic Advisor for Commerce National Bank. He is president and owner of Economic Perspectives, Inc., as well as adjunct professor at The Ohio State University. Previously, he served as director of the Keller Graduate School of Management at DeVry University's Columbus Branch and vice president and chief economic economist for Management Horizons, uh, a market research and management consulting firm. Please welcome Jim Newton. Jim. <laughs> Prior to founding Regionomics, I told him I had to pronounce that carefully, our second panelist spent 12 years as the vice president in economic analysis of, for economic analysis, uh, for the Columbus Chamber of Commerce and four years with Rickenbacker Port Authority. He is an experienced educator and has been an adjunct faculty member at Capital University School of Management and The Ohio State University's Departments of Finance and Workforce Development. He serves on the Board of Trustees, most importantly, of the Columbus Metropolitan Club. Please welcome Bill Lafayette. And Columbus Dispatch business reporter Mark Williams will lead the discussion this afternoon. Mark writes about employment, banking, insurance, and personal finance, among other things. Uh, before joining the Dispatch, he worked for the Associated Press for 14 years, the last two years as the National Energy Writer. Please welcome Mark Williams. And Mark, it's, it's all yours. Actually, for about a minute, it's oh, all look mine. at him jumping. <laughs> <in>. <laughs> um, 
I, I do want to thank uh, CMC for having me back for an 11th consecutive year. Um, I, I really appreciate that. Um, I, uh, I also want to thank the Columbus Dispatch for their support both today and throughout the year. Um, and another important thing that I want to make clear, uh, as I guess you all know now, I am now a small business owner and I am unaffiliated with anybody. So I, I want to make it very clear that from now on, I am speaking only for myself, for no one else. Um, and the last thing is uh, a, a question that may be crossing your minds. Why am I sitting down? Um, we're trying something a little bit different this year, and I, I hope you'll let me know how it works. Uh, Mark Williams calls uh, both Jim and me when he's working on stories. Mm -hmm. And lot. often these calls will turn into 20, 30 minute conversations. They're, they get really, really interesting and I just thought I would like to share the experience with all of you. So uh, please let me know what you think of this and if CMC has me back next year, maybe we'll do this, maybe we'll do something else, who knows. But thanks for being here. Yeah, and I agree. Thanks for everybody showing up today. This is really a, um, a wonderful thing for me to be a part of, to have a time to talk with these two about some of the esoteric conversations that we have on topics that, uh, oh, like new car sales or weekly unemployment claims or all those other things I'm sure that you all can't wait to see when you get up in the morning. Um, so anyway, um, so let's get started. Jim, do you want to go ahead and, and talk about your forecast for the, uh, for the upcoming year? Sure. Um, by the way, I'm not going to take my minute. Bill had his. I'm going to just let mine pass and do you all a favor. <laughs> uh, now, do I have to separate you two? No. <laughs> Actually, as I, as I was driving here today, I was trying to think about if I had to have a, a kind of a, a, a quick little summary of, of what I think of the years 2011 that we just concluded and what 2012 is going to look like, uh, I guess it would be this. Sometimes not bad is good enough. <laughs> um, I mean, if you kind of roll down through how we looked last year, in most instances you, you can say, eh, not bad. Uh, economic growth, not good, but not bad, uh, given that some areas of the world are in recession. Uh, employment growth, uh, compared to previous recoveries, expansion periods, it's really pretty pathetic. But it's not bad. Uh, about 1.6 or so million jobs created. Stock market, well, not much of a good change there. Uh, but again, compared to a lot of nations, not bad. Actually, flat can be relatively good. I think that's what we saw last year. And in my opinion, we're not going to see anything terribly different this year. If you loved 2011, 2012 is going to be your year. <laughs> Well, the way I would put it is, I've been down so long that down looks like up to me. Um, I, I pretty much agree with Jim. Um, it's going to be an okay year, not great. Um, our, we do have some differences in our forecast, though, and uh, those differences are actually somewhat less than what they appear on the surface. <coughs> Uh, I am expecting uh, growth for this year. Let's have a nice round number, 100,000 net new jobs. Um, about, uh, or gosh, um, it, it's about 1.1%, something like that. Not, uh, not anything that's going to sop up large numbers of the unemployed, but uh, Certainly not, not, not too bad. I said 100,000, I meant 10,000, dang it. <laughs> and, and Bill, point of clarification, you're speaking of the uh, metropolitan area. I am speaking of the Columbus metropolitan area, uh, which is eight counties. And uh, Jim, did um, your forecast for, I mean, this is what we're, I know the economy is always and very important to everybody here, but what we really like to talk about, of course, is jobs. So what is uh, jobs? 
I'm looking this year probably uh, about half of Woodville is, so a little under 5,000. Uh, we have a few critical sectors where we kind of disagree in terms of what the outlook looks like. The thing is, uh, and, and this is one of those things to realize about these forecasts that we put together on employment growth, employment is not necessarily a great indicator of economic growth. Uh, in some respects, whether it's 1.1% or 0.5%, the latter, of course, being the correct one. Um, <laughs> in some respects, uh, doesn't amount to a whole lot of difference uh, because it, it takes so very little to be considered an employed person in the United States to have a new job created. Uh, the government does two surveys every month uh, during the week that contains the 12th day of the month. That's when they actually do the work. And to be considered an employed person in this country, you have to work basically one big whopping hour for compensation during that reference period. Uh, that doesn't produce a lot of income. Um, you know, one thing to realize is whether it's 1.1% or, or the correct one um, is that, that even with job creation uh, potentially looking reasonably good, that does not necessarily generate the income that allows us to spend, which then allows the economy to grow. For some people, for example, as, as they get a job, as they leave the roles of the unemployed, it's not unlikely that as they move from unemployed to employed, they could find very little change in the actual income that they receive because now they're going to be paying payroll taxes and income taxes and everything else. It's conceivable they may even have less income depending upon that job because wage rates are not rising very rapidly. It could be that as they get jobs, even if they're good ones, they may literally spend years trying to dig out of the hole that they found themselves in after long-term unemployment. So employment growth is an important thing, but it does not necessarily translate into economic growth and what that suggests. With, with that in mind, what would be considered a healthy number of jobs that would be created in a normal sort of economy? I would tend to think here in Columbus, if we could have uh, employment growth that is at least uh, half a percentage point above population growth, mm -hmm. then that's the kind of thing that is going to allow the unemployment rate to come down over time to hopefully allow sufficient income growth that the region can grow more vibrantly. We're not necessarily seeing that at this time. And we really haven't seen that since the 1990s. Um, we had an expansion such as it was in the 2000s, uh, but we, the, the 10,000 net new jobs that I'm forecasting for 2012 is equal to the best job growth that we had in the last decade, namely 2007. So um, you're talking job growth uh, back to the 1990s to get any meaningful uh, decline in unemployment. Looking into 2012 a little bit more specifically, are there particular, particular sectors that you think will be, that you two will think will be stronger than others and some that are eh, like what we've been seeing um, the past few years with, for example, government jobs? Well, government jobs um, are not going to, government is in general not going to do well. Um, Jim is actually a little bit less bearish on government than I am. I'm expecting a decline of something like 1.7% uh, in government this, this coming year. And it's really kind of interesting because uh, the last time at the state level that we saw a sustained decline in government employment like this was uh, at the end of World War II. Um, and uh, so this is something that's really kind of unprecedented. So government is, is kind of the booby prize, but the, the sector that I think we both agree will do the best 
is uh, business services, which is a particularly broad swath of the economy. Uh, there we're expect, or I'm expecting, something like uh, 4,200 net new jobs, 2.9 percent, and I think Jim is expecting something very similar. Yes. Hey, Bill, just before you go on any further, explain what, what kind of jobs you're talking about in that sector. Well, it's, it's three distinct subsectors. We have professional and technical jobs, which would be things like engineering firms, architecture firms, um, marketing, public relations. Um, we have uh, corporate administration. Uh, we have uh, personnel services, waste mm -hmm. services. So it's, it's a very broad sector of the economy. It's more than 150,000 jobs in this area, and it is one of our key economic drivers, particularly the IT subsector within professional services. Very important. Now, one, one area in there that I would kind of point out, and I think it's, it's these days being a little misunderstood in terms of what it may indicate, is temporary help services. Mm -hmm. um, and there's this notion, and I think there was maybe some currency to it in the past, but I really doubt it now. Uh, you probably read this from time to time where it, it is said that businesses that are a little uncertain about the future, they will hire in temporary people, give it a little time, they'll lay off those temporary people and bring in new help, uh, somebody who's going to be hired on a full-time basis. I think that that's, that relationship, if it ever really did exist, is pretty much dead in the water at this point. I think businesses, given the uncertainty in the economy and, and the need to, to temporarily meet um, increased production needs of whatever sort that happens to be, I think more and more temporary help services are being used as a means of just fulfilling that particular need. As soon as that need goes away, those jobs go away, and it does not necessarily lead to new full-time employment. And so this is one area that's going to grow, I think, relatively well, in part because of that area, but I don't think it's going to be a useful indicator of things to come. We've seen in the past several weeks some hopeful signs that the economy is getting better. Car sales, uh, home sales, though, still at the bottom seem to be sort of kind of evening out. Um, manufacturing numbers more, more recently have gotten a little bit better. Is there any sign of hope that some of this will ultimately mean more jobs for, for, uh, for our area? No. <laughs> uh. This is why I Th like that's, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> that's an overstatement. Tell us what you really think. Um, I think there's an unfortunate tendency to look at these numbers in isolation, to get a month or two of good numbers like this, and then just kind of straight line it into the future and assume that this is going to continue indefinitely. I don't think that's true. Uh, while it's true, yesterday uh, we saw the uh, uh, ISM, the, the manufacturing index going up here in the United States, indicating growth, wonderful thing. Look around the rest of the world, and that's not nearly so true. Um, in Europe, it's heading down in virtually every major country. Uh, India is still heading up. China, well, we're not sure about China. One estimate said it was up, another estimate set it down, so call it kind of stagnant. No country operates in isolation, the United States included. So if, if we're seeing these kind of strains elsewhere in the world, chances are it's just a matter of time before we're going to see some sort of slowdown here. Hopefully not to the point where we see huge numbers of job losses, but personally, I don't think the American consumer is in shape right now so that they're going to carry the manufacturing sector as it presently stands in the United States. Uh, we're going to have to have some help from abroad. That was one of our areas of growth last year, uh, export activity. That is going to dissipate somewhat this year, and so I think the manufacturing sector is going to start slowing down as the year progresses. 
Especially with uh, the problems in the Eurozone. Absolutely. Uh, Europe is going to be constantly kind of on our minds here, both in terms of what it means in a very material kind of way with our import export position, and just as surely so in terms of the stability of financial markets, both there and then back here at home as well. Because, kind of like we saw back in 2008, our financial crisis became everybody else's. Europe in total, if you look at the EU in total, is bigger than the United States. The Eurozone, 17 nations that actually utilize uh, the Euro as their common currency, is almost as big as the United States. Something like that cannot be in crisis and not have a substantial impact on all the rest of us, the US included. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's perplexing to us at the dispatch, we've written a couple times about this, is that even though we've had this struggling economy, even though we have this high unemployment rate that has been painfully high for what seems to be going on forever, we still have some employers that still have difficulty filling openings. I'm thinking particularly IT sorts of jobs. Can, can you guys sort of explain what's happening here and some of this what seems to be some sort of disconnect between employers and employees? It, it's, it is, it's in a lot of cases a fundamental mismatch between the skills that employers need and the skills of the people who are walking in off the street with their resumes. Um, I did a uh, study last summer on the uh, IT workforce in Columbus. And uh, the mismatch there was very strong. Employers were telling us that a lot of the skills that were lacking in their employees were what are called soft skills. Things like being able to communicate effectively, uh, being able to work with your uh, colleagues, being able to communicate effectively with customers. And on top of that, the IT industry itself is evolving very, very rapidly, and it's just very difficult to uh, keep ahead of all the changes that are going on and keeping people's skills current. And so um, there are jobs, literally, that are going begging because they can't find the people to fill them. And taking it one step further, um and, and I, I don't have a good feel for exactly how much of a problem this is. Typically, we describe this thing called structural unemployment as a mismatch between the job skills that unemployed people have versus the job skills required of, of uh, currently available jobs. There's another aspect of structural unemployment that in most cases is not terribly important, but maybe is kind of significant in this area. And that is sometimes there is, is this geographical divide between where the jobs are and where the people are who actually have those skills. And, and what we may be finding now to some degree is that there's something that is basically kind of cementing people into a particular area that makes them immobile, and that's sadly housing, mm -hmm. um, where somebody is just plain stuck because they don't have the capability to get out from an underwater mortgage. Um, I happened to read a column by a guy who writes for the Delaware Gazette. Um, that would be me. Um, <laughs> And you know, last fall when Obama was coming up with his uh, employment package and the Republicans had theirs, this guy, me, uh, came up with what I thought was a clever alternative. We've seen, we've seen all kinds of programs that have been instituted with regard to housing that are supposed to revitalize it. In my mind, set those things aside, you know, truly. Uh, now, this may not apply to, to huge, huge, huge numbers of people, but if we're going to use government as this entity, perhaps, that is going to try to improve, in this case, labor market mobility, take some of those dollars in these, to date, largely worthless uh, housing uh, assistance programs, redirect them, 
and allow the government effectively to help people buy out from under these situations where they are immobile, where they have the skills needed in a job that's available someplace else. We're not going to have, as I would view it, not have the government simply give them money, but provide them basically a loan. It's gonna follow them through their life. You're never gonna get out from under this but it provides that stimulus potentially to this issue of structural unemployment. It allows people to finally get out from under and to move to where the jobs are, and then they can start fresh. They benefit, that employer benefits, and in the final analysis, the U.S. economy benefits. And if I had to guess, I would guess that Columbus would be a net beneficiary of a program like this. The reason why I say that is that there are some housing indexes that show that Columbus uh, housing has declined a whole lot less than average. And given that, uh, people in other places may be more underwater than people are here. So what, what's going on is people are being prevented by these underwater mortgages from coming here more than going there. Just a guess. Ohio lost about uh, 400,000 jobs in 2008 and 9. Nationally, it's somewhere around 9 million during that period, give or take. We're about a quarter of the way back. And normally by this point, after a recession, we're seeing pretty good economy, lots of things going on that are really positive. And I know that there's been a lot of talk about how this recession is different um, because the origins of it started with a financial crisis. Um, is that the reason why we are still kind of bumbling along or is there something else going on here that pretend, you know, portend, shows off the future as being not as positive as what we would normally see after a recession? Okay. Um. Yes, uh, yeah. you know, I, I think a fair amount of it can be um, kind of laid at the doorstep of the financial sector and what we did. If you've ever been to these events before and listened to me, you may have come to the conclusion that I don't much like government, uh, and I don't. Um, I think government has been a total screw up in this area. Um, that, that and, and this is not a case of deregulation. Uh, deregulation, as I view it, was never a problem here in the United States. The deregulation in the financial sector dates back to the Clinton administration uh, that allowed some of those old depression era laws to finally go by the wayside. They put in place uh, reasonable safeguards, reasonable regulations uh, at that time. The unfortunate thing is, in my opinion, that happened in the 2000s under the administration of George W. Bush, he indicated that he wanted to increase the, the home ownership rate in the United States. Uh, he wanted to do it, the Democrats in Congress wanted to do it, all God's children wanted to do it. And, and in so doing, they allowed uh, mortgages that have, should never have moved forward to be initiated. They allowed a packaging of these things as mortgage-backed securities, either backed by the likes of Fannie and Freddie or not, to reach into the marketplace. It produced because the government simply walked away from its regulatory duties. It allowed these kinds of imbalances to develop within the economy, and literally, it is going to take us years and years and years to dig out from these bad decisions. Um, even now, and I have no, no numbers to back this up, my guess is there are lots of banks around the country that are still loaded up with these mortgage-backed securities. They are still on their books. They are still kind of dragging down their capabilities to lend money to businesses, to individuals. Uh, and there's nothing to do with them. There's nobody to buy them. And so they just hang there like an albatross around these institutions' heads. And so I don't think there's any quick way out of this. Uh, government's not going to be able to do anything. The private sector isn't, except just slowly expand. 
so that we can eventually find ourselves back on a more favorable growth path. One of the really, really scary things that uh, I heard when all this crisis was still going on is I went to a seminar at OSU, and the speaker was one of my professors in finance theory from my PhD program at Ohio State. And he said that finance theory was not up to the task of valuing these derivative securities. No one knew what they were worth. Uh, the, the buyers didn't, the sellers didn't, nobody knew the, the true extent of the damage that, that they could cause. And, and um, I agree with Jim, this is going to be a, a long slog. The, um, a year ago, we started seeing some signs of things starting to get better. Then along came a bunch of things that nobody could ever have foreseen. We had the tsunami and earthquake in Japan. Mm -hmm. We had the Arab Spring. We had oil prices skyrocket during the spring. Mm -hmm. And then plus then we had the whole debt debate in Washington and now moving over into Europe. Anything on your thinking caps here that shows 2012 that something that we might not already know that could potentially be a problem for us? Something will happen because something <laughs> always does happen. It's, it's what Rumsfeld used to call the unknown unknowns, that we have the known unknowns, which are things like the inability to reach a budget deal, uh, the, the problems in the European economy, but then something else will happen. Who knows where the earthquake is going to be, where the revolution is going to occur, uh, where the bad weather is going to occur that's going to drive food prices up. We, we just don't know. And that's, what, uh, that's why you always have to take these forecasts with a huge, huge dose of salt. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're starting to get uh, towards the end of our time, so I know that we, uh, our time for here, we could go on all day, as you guys can see. So um, I'm going to ask one more question, and then, uh, as is in tradition for this event, um, we will then um, start to allow questions from you all. Um, I guess they should queue up at the uh, microphone? Yes. Yeah, okay. So um, I, 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 anyone could do that now, I suppose, while I ask this final question. We have um, seen these huge discoveries of natural gas in the eastern part of the state. Um, I'm not necessarily suggesting that this is going to translate into meaningful jobs here in uh, Columbus, um, but certainly in the eastern part of the state, we've seen a couple of different you know, studies. One that was done by an industry group talked about 200,000 jobs mm -hmm. potentially over the next several years, and Jim's already making a face over that one. <laughs> I and am then, too, you just can't see me. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, then one more recently, another study suggested more about 20,000. Um, I guess my question is twofold. Um, a, does it, is, is which one probably is closer to correct? And B, does it matter, you know, jobs are jobs regardless of how many are being created? Yes, jobs are jobs. Uh, and obviously any job created is, is going to uh, uh, be a net positive for the state of Ohio. In terms of which is more accurate, in my opinion, without a doubt, it's the second one, not the first one. Um, it's one of those things that just drives me crazy. Um, every time uh, some industry group is trying to give an indication as to how wonderful things are going to be if you just pass this legislation, if you just allow this activity to occur, we're going to have this monstrous, monstrous impact on the economy. What a bunch of nonsense. Yeah. Um, it's utilizing something called input-output analysis by its very nature, and everybody uses this because every Everybody knows you're going to get an outlandishly high number. Everybody utilizes this because if you look at the direct, indirect, and induced employment growth that comes from it, you get this really, really big number. But it's just dumb. 
Um, so that if you consider it and which one's more likely, chances are it's going to be closer to the 20,000 figure. And even within that 20,000, that's not 20,000 on an ongoing basis. A lot of that is going to be the initial setup, the initial construction activity, the long-term permanent job, significantly less than that. But again, absolutely. It's the kind of thing that will create jobs here in the state of Ohio, and the beauty is it's going to allow for some energy independence in this country, and it's going to help reduce, as we're now seeing, natural gas prices over time. And I'll turn it back over to Rich. Well, as Mark has indicated, we always allow time for uh, some Q&A, and I'm sure there, there are plenty of questions today. I uh, want to remind everybody that we record uh, the forums for televised broadcast on ONN, streaming live on CMC's website, and at the Columbus Metropolitan Library's website. Uh, you're at the microphone. Uh, introduce yourself. Uh, ask your question, and refrain from making long <laughs> editorial comments. Um, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, uh, Phil Sorrentino. It's refreshing to see a couple economists with a sense of humor, so I like that. Um, it's been said during uncertain times you weed out the weak players and the strong ones widen the gap. What can we do to be stronger? Workforce development. Um, no doubt about it. That is what we need. Uh, we need a comprehensive, uh, targeted workforce strategy that aligns very closely with our economic development targets. We need to understand what those economic development targets need in terms of workforce training. We need to uh, uh, provide it, and we need to make it accessible to people. That's what we need to uh, strengthen ourselves as, as we move further into the recovery. For an individual business, I think the most important thing is going to be market positioning. Um, the, the market itself is going to grow relatively little over time, almost regardless of which sector you're in. Uh, if you're hoping to be one of those who doesn't fall by the wayside, in some respects you're going to have to take it out of somebody else's hide. Um, and that is just an unfortunate, nasty uh, fact of life now. Uh, you're going to be successful only at the expense of somebody else. Uh, but then the thing to realize is, you know, obnoxious as it may seem, failure is just as important in a market-based economy as success. Uh, you have to let those who really can't quite make it fail. You shouldn't prop them up, uh, allow them to fail. Hopefully they'll do better at something else. And those who can do well, Good for them. Hopefully they will be highly successful. Thanks. Good afternoon. I'm Jim Rutledge from the law firm of Bricker and Eckler. Would you please compare and contrast the Columbus metropolitan region with the other regions in Ohio? Well, something odd happened, has happened over the last few years, um, and that is that uh, Columbus is no longer the best performing uh, region of the state. Um, the areas that uh, actually the state as a whole uh, gained more employment percentage-wise this last year than, than we did. And that's been the case since the uh, uh, expansion began. And what's really behind that is a good growth in manufacturing employment. We, at the state and national level, we're seeing increases in manufacturing employment, the like of which we haven't seen since the early 1990s. We're seeing them uh, nationally. We're seeing them statewide. Unfortunately, we are not seeing them in this region. And there's a, a very clear reason for that, at least when you dig into the numbers. The reason why our manufacturing employment has not been growing is uh, uh, the automotive and parts manufacturers who are continuing to produce more with not more people, uh, unlike their counterparts in other places. I do think that they're going to hit a productivity wall at some point, and I, actually my forecast is, is thinking that 
maybe that's going to be this year and we're finally going to see some increase in manufacturing employment. But uh, it's the more manufacturing dependent regions that really have done better over the last couple years. And so isn't it sad to think that Columbus can be outperformed by the likes of Youngstown? Uh, and yet that type of thing is happening. The thing is, uh, two things. Number one, recognize they're starting from the cellar. Um, you know, they have fallen so far so long that it doesn't take a whole heck of a lot to produce decent growth. Uh, as well, it's important to realize, you know, moving beyond just manufacturing, that Columbus really does have a good base of employment. It tends to be this steady performer over time, and truly sometimes being the tortoise rather than the hare uh, is really much, much better. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is John McGorry, uh, I'm a partner at Webface. Uh, my question is, the, the internet has had a lot of impact on profit margins over the last few years. Uh, uh, Things like TrueCar.com and other things like that. Uh, my question is, what is going to be the long-term impact on the, of the internet on the economy as we move forward and, and continues to push profits down? Well, I, just speaking from my own narrow self-interest, uh, the, the, the benefit of the internet is, uh, is that it democratizes information. Um, it is so much easier to do my job now than it was 10 or 15 years ago. It, it, just the uh, ready availability of information and the ability that I have to promote my business on the internet. Uh, at a very, very low cost. Um, I, th I think, at least from that standpoint, the internet can be very, very beneficial to small startup businesses. And one of the things I think it's going to do, and, and you know, I, I talk about this in uh, all the classes I teach. If you all want to come, I'll be doing it this Friday uh, at OSU. Um, just, just come on by. Um, <laughs> We talk about competition, we talk about various types of market structures. One of them we talk about is something called perfect competition. And one of the features of, of perfect competition, this, this highly competitive atmosphere, is information, access to information. The more information we have as consumers, the better we can put feet to the fire under businesses. And I think that's going to be one of the real booms uh, to the internet, you know, it's going to make business people be much, much better at what they do. It provides us much more information. I'm sure we've all read, say, this past Christmas, kind of leading up to it, how it is the consumers will walk into a retail outlet with a something like a smartphone in hand, and they are just deadly. Mm -hmm. uh, they really require that retailer to be very good at what they do, be ready to price match, Otherwise, that person is going to turn around and walk out. You know, I think what it's going to do is make the competitive atmosphere much, much more intense. And that is certainly going to be something that helps consumers a lot and truly does make businesses much better at what they do. And if you're not, sadly, that's going to be one of those things that may produce failure. Uh, we're seeing that now with the likes of Sears and Kmart. Uh, you know, they've basically stood still for the last two to three decades. You just can't do it. Right. Uh, Gene Krebs, Greater Ohio. Uh, first, a data point, and that is, is that Cuyahoga County in November recorded a lower unemployment rate than Franklin County. So it wasn't that they had further to go. In absolute comparative terms, they're doing better than what Franklin County is now. You've not mentioned shifting topics, so you've not mentioned the agricultural sector. And if you look at the cholera counties around Franklin County, they're very heavily engaged in agriculture, mm -hmm. and farmers are now en engaged in three, uh, the third year of extraordinarily high commodity prices for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. And we can debate, is this a three-year bubble, a six-year bubble, or a 30-year bubble? I'm thinking, that I'm hoping it's a 30-year bubble. Um, how much impact will that have as farmers, especially as it relates to sprawl, as farmers now find it more advantageous to raise split peas than split levels, 
mm. how that influenced the overall growth, but also as farmers get all this extra income and they start spending it in places like Marysville and um, you know, uh, Fairfield County and places like that, how's that going to impact everything? Uh, the agricultural sector is extremely important, and it's more important to uh, the Columbus area than many of us think. Um, one of the weaknesses of uh, s the statistics that uh, we look at to do these forecasts is that it doesn't adequately cover agricultural employment, but um, it's, it is either the first or second most important industry to the state, it, uh, it, could, uh, it could be a real opportunity for us to grow the kind of food manufacturing operations that, uh, that will take the produce from these folks and uh, locally and uh, cut down on transportation costs, increase freshness, and provide employment. That's something that I've been thinking about for a while. Um, but uh, as, as from a sprawl standpoint, uh, if we can keep land in farms and productive and, and making people money, that's a good thing. I would agree by and large. The only thing I would say is I don't know that there's a, a real strong reason in terms of, of uh, food processing to think that, that we're particularly well suited any more than any other place uh, for manufacturing activities to occur here. Transportation costs are reasonable uh, and so it's probably going to continue going to those established uh, food processing centers that we already have. So I'm not sure that the manufacturing thing's a possibility really you know, unless we uh, throw open arms and lots of money at them. Mm. Um, but certainly farm income I think is going to hold up extremely well for some years to come and that has to be a boon to the local economy. Mm -hmm. Hi Bill. Uh, my name's Ken Lazar and I put people to work. Uh, I got this email uh, the other day, I, I want to do a reality check, I'm sure it wasn't from you. But uh, it said that the U.S. would have to create 135,000 new jobs every month for the unemployment rate to come down below 8% by 2018. Is that a realistic number? If anything, I think it's a touch low, don't you? Probably. Because uh, the forecasts now are on the order of 175. You're saying, what, 175 to 200 a month, something like that? Uh, for this I, in terms year? of what I'm looking for this year in terms of ta total payroll employment, one and three quarter to two million jobs, which, which comes out, let's say, roughly about 150,000 jobs mm -hmm. or thereabouts per month. That's enough to, under normal circumstances, to keep the unemployment rate pretty much stable. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing is that we've been seeing now for, well, quite a few years here in the United States is, is a relatively strong discouraged worker effect. We're seeing lots of people simply walking away from labor markets. Eventually those people, or at least some of those people, are going to come back into the labor market. And as they do, uh, though it may seem, one of the things that may represent a, a better labor market environment is, oddly enough, a rising unemployment rate. Um, because those people finally build up the confidence to come back into the economy, enough new jobs are created that they think maybe this is finally my time to come back in and try and find a job. And as that happens, the number of unemployed go up. So, you know, yes, you know, you need about, oh, it, everybody has their own estimates, 125, 150,000 jobs per month just to keep the unemployment rate stable, but there are lots of dynamics to the labor market that that doesn't really contain within it. I, I ignore the unemployment rate, except when uh, Mark makes me look at it, which he does every month. Um, for that very reason. The, the unemployment rate is a truly lousy indicator of the health of the labor market. Um, we got all excited when our unemployment rate uh, fell to, well, seasonally adjusted in November, 6.9%, which sounds really, really good 
But when you step back and you look at why that unemployment rate fell, it did not fall because more people were working. It fell because fewer people were looking for work. Uh, the, the labor force actually shrank a fair amount over the course of this year. I'm not sure I actually believe that. I think the numbers are screwy. But, uh, uh, but that, that's, that's the point. You don't look at the unemployment rate. You look at payroll employment growth. I'm Jane Scott. Thank you for the cheery beginning for our CMC year. We, uh, <laughs> very much appreciate that. Um, I've heard it said that it's kind of a takeoff on what you just said, Bill. If you're employed, the employment rate is zero. If you're not employed, the employment rate is 100%. I'm wondering if there is a socially appropriate, socially inappropriate uh, uh, sort of effect of people being hesitant to spend money. Seems to be a lot of people are employed and they're extremely well employed and there's money flowing for lots and lots of things in this economy, maybe just in central Ohio, but you know, when we travel, the lines are long at airports and there's money that is definitely being spent. Do you think there's a latent effect that might at some point come to the surface and some people start spending more money again? Well, that, that is one of the things that uh, could make this year better than what the uh, common wisdom holds. Um, uh, I, I, don't, I don't really know where it comes from. I'm not sure that it's going to happen, but uh, there, is, there is like four or five years of pent-up demand in, in a lot of cases. People's cars wear out. Uh, people's computers wear out. Um, people have done without for so many years that if they can get just a little bit of confidence and start spending a little bit, you set yourself up for a virtuous cycle where more spending leads to more production, which leads to more employment, which leads to more spending and so forth. Uh, I don't know how that happens this year. I'm really hoping that it does, but uh, I'm not holding my breath. And then there's the pessimistic point of view. <laughs> uh, I don't think we're in a position yet to see that kind of thing occurring. Um, and in fact, I think there, there's somewhat of a misread in terms of what's happening with the consumer sector. Uh, we've probably all heard uh, over the past couple of months, and this started back with uh, Black Friday uh, sales, that it's just been a great year for retailing. Um, that, that the fourth quarter of this year will turn out to be very strong. Well, that may be right, or then again, it may not. Um, one thing to recognize is there is, and then this kind of gets to the issue here, there is a very, very considerable difference between retail spending and consumer spending. Um, retail sales account for about 41, 42 percent of total consumer spending. Uh, the rest of it is done on services. So if you dig into the numbers, if you look at the personal income and spending numbers for the United States over these past few months, while we hear how retailing has just been taking off, if you look at total consumer spending, it's been pretty darn meager. Mm -hmm. uh, in November, as I recall, uh, consumer spending increased seasonally adjusted one-tenth of a one percent. Yes. That's it. Uh, you know, I don't think the consumer is in a position right now yet uh, to increase spending in any, any substantive way so that it creates the job uh, to create the production needs, to create the income to get us into this virtuous cycle. You know, I think we still have a long way to go before we're going to get there. Uh, so once again, not bad is probably good enough. Uh, it's not going to be bad this year. I may sound like a pessimist, and maybe I am. I think the economy is going to do relatively well, relative to a lot of other nations. I think employment is going to do relatively well compared to a lot of other nations. 
it's just not going to be the kind of thing that's really spectacular, not the kind of thing that is going to make us feel the way we might have back in the 1990s or the early 2000s, that there's so much growth that everybody gets to share in it. Um, it's going to be a very limited growth and does provide some opportunities. Well, that was almost a positive comment. <laughs> we <probably laughs> so we'll, Let us hope. We'll, we'll, we'll end on, on that positive note. Jane, maybe we should put a bar next year. The, the, uh, the, want to continue the conversation. Uh, that's, that's the uh, purpose of, of this organization, uh, to have a community conversation. And we invite you to have coffee and cookies out in the lobby. Next week, sign up for Dr. Gee. Uh, it should be a, a, a fun event. We'll hear lots of unusual questions and challenging ones, I'm sure. I uh, want to thank today's sponsor, again, the Columbus Dispatch, and also our, our panelists, Bill Lafayette, Jim Newton, and our moderator, Mark Williams. Thank you all for coming. Come back next week. <laughs>